Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. If you would be so kind as to take out your Bibles <clears throat> and turn to the book of John chapter 14 and then John chapter um, 5, we're going to read uh, John 14 uh, verse 12 and John chapter 5 uh, verse 1 through 20. Give you a second, as well as myself, a second to find that. John chapter 14, verse 12 reads, <clears throat> Verily, verily, I say unto you, and this is our theme verse that we covered on last week. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. So who qualifies to do the works that Jesus has done? Those that believe. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these, because I go unto my Father. Now, we want to hang a left and go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, <clears throat> and we're going to read... Uh, quite a bit here. John chapter 5, verse 1 through 20. John chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. <clears throat> and it reads, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Then who, who, whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man there, which had an infirmity, 38, 30 and 8 years, when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been there, for a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another step is down before me. <clears throat> Verse 8, Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. And the, the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. <clears throat> Excuse me. He answered them, he that made me whole, the same said unto me, take up thy bed and walk. Then they asked him, what is it? What man is that which said unto thee, take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed was not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away. I love the language of King James. He conveyed himself away. A multitude <laughs> being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. Slay him, because... He had done these things on the Sabbath day. They wanted to kill Jesus because of how he healed the man, but it was on the Sabbath. We'll get to that in a second. <clears throat> but Jesus answered, answered them, um, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also, that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered the Jews, and then Jesus answered and said unto them, rather, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what 
he sees what he seeth the Father do. For whatsoever things he doeth, these also the Son doeth like, these also doeth the Son likewise. Amen. For the Father love, loveth the Son, and sheweth him all things that himself doeth, and will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. We're picking back up on the series we talked about uh, starting last week, and actually even the last time I ministered. Greater works shall you do, and today we're going to be speaking from the subject Doing what you see your father doing. Doing what you see your father doing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this time together. But Lord, even though we're not physically together, Lord, we're united in heart and therefore united in you. And we thank you for you teaching us Holy Spirit this morning. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. <clears throat> Greater work shall you do. Doing what you see your father doing. I want to ask a question that, <clears throat> excuse me, I heard someone say the other day, are you a fan or are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Are you a fan or are you a follower of Jesus Christ? A fan is someone who gets real excited and they are very enthusiastic in their admiration for a particular athlete or a team or entertainment or, what, uh, or whatever. But fans want to get close enough just to, just to be able to share in the benefits, um, but not so close that it requires a sacrifice. Let me say that again. A fan wants to be close enough just to be able to get the benefits but not so close that it requires a sacrifice. I was talking with somebody uh, yesterday, and they were we were talking about the upcoming NFL schedule, and they were like, "Yeah, when do we play Tampa Bay?" Because they wanted to see Tom Brady. You football fans know he's left New England, and now he's playing for the um, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And they kept saying, "When do we play?" Uh, uh, Tom Brady. When do we play the Buccaneers? Now I understand what they're saying. They love their team so much that they identify that they say we, but their name is not on the roster. They do not get a check from the McCaskey family. <laughs> they do not go out there and practice with them. I guarantee you, they may watch their practice, but they're not out there running with them. They're not out there lifting weights with them. They're not out there eating special stuff. In other words, they're getting some benefits, but they're not really sacrificing the same way that the players were. Amen. Followers of Jesus have a different posture than fans do. What do I mean? You ever follow somebody in a car? You're, you're going somewhere and because you don't know where you're going, you actually hop in your car and you're following someone uh, and as they turn, you turn and so forth. Well, have you ever followed somebody who has no patience for waiting on the person that's following them. I'm thinking of a particular person that I've known uh, very well for many, many years. And one of the things that I used to hate to do was to follow this particular person, especially if we were going into the south side of Chicago or the west side of Chicago or even downtown, different areas, before I got somewhat familiar with even parts of it. This person would jump, would say, hey, come on, follow me. And you'd hop in your car, and as you're following behind them, they're all the way in the fast lane. And then next thing you know, they go from the, the fast lane over by the divider, and then they're weaving in and out, and without giving any signal whatsoever, they're getting off at this exit, or they're turning on this street, or jumping over to another particular part. I used to hate following them, but see, here's the thing. The reason I used to hate following them is because I had to stay close. You can't really follow somebody like that until you stay close with them. What am I getting at? You can't follow Jesus from a distance and understand where he's going, where he's turning, where he's moving next. Are you a fan of Jesus 
where you just want to follow afar off like some people did. They were fine when he was uh, multiplying the two fish and the five loaves of bread and he was feeding the multitude. They were fine with going to services like that. They were fine with, with participating uh, with Jesus and his disciples concerning that part, but they were not fine with following him in everywhere in close relationship with him. Are you following Jesus or are you following religious tradition? In John chapter 5, verse 16, the Bible says that Jewish leaders sought to kill Jesus. Or, or rather, yeah, uh, what we just read. Uh, the Jewish leaders sought to kill Jesus because he healed a man on the Sabbath and said, take up his bed and walk. They were upset. Because on the Sabbath, you weren't supposed to do any work of any kind. This man had been laying on his bed for 38 years, almost 40 years. This man had a crippling condition and they were upset. Instead of rejoicing over the fact that a tremendous miracle of the Lord had taken place, they were upset that he was actually uh, carrying around his bed on the Sabbath. There was another uh, passage of scripture where Jesus healed a particular woman. And as he healed the woman, the ruler of the synagogue stood up and answered, the Bible says, answered with indignation saying, well, if she was going to be healed, if you're going to be healed, then you're going to have to do it on the other six days, but you can't do it on the Sabbath. They were totally missing the point. Someone say, amen. Instead of rejoicing over the fact that God touched the man, they were more upset that Jesus disregarded their tradition. I want to read a passage of scripture out of Matthew chapter 15. <clears throat> and I want to read Matthew chapter 15, verse 2 and 3. And then I'm going to read Matthew uh, 6 and 9 out of the New Living Translation. And here's what it says, Matthew 2 and 3 out of New Living Translations. <clears throat> the the Jewish leaders were saying unto Jesus, why do your disciples disobey our age old traditions? They demanded. They ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand washing before they eat. Jesus replied, and why do you by your traditions violate the direct commandments of God? I'm skipping to verse six through nine again out of the new living translation. And here's what it says. And so, by your own tradition, you nullify the direct commandment of God. You hypocrites. Isaiah was prophesying about you when he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart hearts are far away. Their worship is a farce. For they replace God's commands with their own man-made teachings. Jesus was rebuking them without getting into a whole different subject. Jesus was rebuking these religious leaders because they were more concerned about a ritualistic purity rather than the purity that was in their hearts. In other words, they were keeping an external commandment and tradition, but at the same time, they were honoring ritualistic purity more than the purity uh, and, and heart for God that was uh, that, that is supposed to be in them. You know, <clears throat> in the church, there are so many things that we do just simply because we've been taught out of tradition. And I don't want to upset anybody and... Um, I don't want to sound disrespectful, but the Bible says that when Paul began to preach to the Bereans, they didn't just take what he said, but they searched the scriptures to see whether or not it'd be so. You all hear me say this all the time at Living River. Don't just take my word for it just because you trust me, but search the scriptures to see whether or not they'd be so. Who said we have to baptize people only on first Sunday. I'm, I, I've been studying the Bible for over 20 some years, but I've never been able to see where it says that we only supposed to bap that we're only supposed to take communion or baptize people on the first Sunday. That is a religious tradition. I, I heard <laughs> at one particular church, somebody happened to touch the communion table and they said, Hey, don't do that. That's sacred. Well, how do you think that the table got in there? Some, some hands had to assemble it. Some hands had to actually carve on it and actually 
actually moving into the church. We've got to be able to move past just simple religious tradition and doing certain things just because we've been used to doing it. You all at Living River have heard me share the story about the uh, uh, woman who was making uh, dinner, I think Thanksgiving, and she was cooking for her family and she was cooking a ham. And what she began to do, she cut the ham in three different places. And she took cut off the shank, put it in the pan, cut off another piece, put it in another pan, and then put the remaining part in a different pan. And her daughter was there saying, Mom, why are you uh, cooking the ham in three parts? She said, Baby, I don't know. We'll have to ask my mother. Fortunately, her mother was still alive, and she asked her mom, and she said, Well, I really don't know. I only did it because I saw my mother do it. And so they were able to call up the great-grandmother, and when they asked her the question, she burst out into laughter, and she said, Oh, baby, the only reason why I cooked it that way was because I didn't have a pan that was big enough. How many religious traditions have we passed down from generation to generation that have gone unchallenged, not ch ch to challenge it in a rebellious sense, but challenge it from the standpoint of, is this really what God wants? Is this really what God says? Because I want us to know that especially in the days that we are in, religious tradition is not going to cut it. As a matter of fact, a lot of things that we're going to start seeing that the Lord is doing are going to defy things that we have been used to for quite some time. Amen. There's so much more to our walk in God and our service unto him than we have imagined. But for this to take place, we've got to get beyond tradition. And I want you to know it may get ugly. What do you mean it may get ugly? Because what I mean by it may get ugly is breaking tradition requires a radical reimagining of not only who God is, but who we are. When we begin to realize how Jesus really is and who he really is, then we begin to realize who we really are and how we really are. As if it wasn't enough for Jesus to heal someone on the Sabbath, then Jesus goes and makes this bold statement in John chapter 5, verse 17 through 20. Let's look at this right quick. It says, but Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto and I work. Therefore, the Jews sought to kill him because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but also because he, uh, because, uh, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For whatsoever things he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and sheweth him all things that he himself doeth, and will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. They were incensed at the fact, not just that Jesus healed on the Sabbath, but they were indignant over the fact <clears throat> excuse me, that Jesus said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. What do you mean? The Bible says in Philippians chapter two, verse five through six, and I'm reading this out of the New King James uh, translation. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it, to, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. I got to read that one more time. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. I got a question for you that say that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you see yourself as compared to God? I have news for you. <laughs> My Bible says, as he is, it's in first John, look it up as he is. That's when it says, as he is, it's talking about Jesus in his glorified form, seated high above every principality and name that is name. And, and, he, uh, and he's been given a name whereby every knee should bow. Not the same Jesus that was walking the shores of Galilee, but this Jesus who is high and lifted up now. The scripture says that <clears throat> we have 
We're, we're in his same image. Forgive me, I lost my train of thought. We're not worms of the dust. We're not just some subservient species. No, 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 no. He didn't create bears in his image. He didn't create falcons in his image. He didn't create hawks in his image. He created man in the image of God. We are in his image. We are in his likeness. Now, let me tell you something. I have three sons and one daughter, and not one of them is a chimpanzee. Not one of them is a horse. Not one of them is a snake. Not one of them is an amoeba. Not one of them is a tadpole. You know what? They're in the same image and likeness that I am. They're in the same image and likeness that I am. So what makes you think that you do not possess the same image, the same divine attributes and characteristics as your heavenly father and your elder brother, Jesus Christ? This is why Jesus said in, said in John chapter 5, verse 19 through 20, and I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, Jesus replied, I assure you, the son can do nothing by himself. He only does what he sees the father is doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and tells him everything he is doing, and the son will do far greater things than healing this man. You will be astonished at what he does. I want to call your attention back to something that I mentioned on last week. One thing I want us to remember is this. We do not have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Everywhere that you hurt, Jesus hurts. Everywhere that you feel, Jesus feels. You got to remember when Jesus was here on the earth, when he walked on water, when he uh, raised the little girl up from the dead, when he cast out devils, when he did miracles, when he healed people's leprosy, everything that Jesus did while he was on the earth, he did as a man. Jesus has two titles for his two mantles. He is the son of God which is his mantle of divinity, but he is also the son of man, which is his mantle of humanity. Everything that Jesus did, he did as the son of man, not the son of God. What I mean by that is the works that Jesus did, he did as a red-blooded human being, man, just like you and I. In other words, Jesus had no advantage over any trial, over any challenge, over any test that he faced. This is why as we are submitted to the Holy Spirit and we obey the Lord and we walk closely with him, we can be triumphant in every situation. Why? Not because Jesus had an advantage over us, but we have the same access to the same Holy Spirit, to the same Father, to the same backing of heaven through everything that you and I face. Let the church say amen. Jesus said, the Father in me, he does the works. The Father in me, he does the works. Sometimes people, I'm, somebody had the nerve to say to me, are you one of them faith healers? No, I'm not. It's the Father in me who does the work. I cannot heal a, a fly with a headache that cross a cracked floor. I have no power. I have no special skills. It is the God in me and it is the God in you that still does the works. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Through his relationship with his father, by not just being a fan of God, but being a follower with him. Because again, when you are a follower, you stay close. When you stay close, you know what they're getting ready to do next. He, we, we, people talk about John, the, the disciple, the beloved, because he had a relationship so that he could put his head on Jesus's breast. That, that's how close they were. And it wasn't anything, uh, perverted or anything like that. But he would ask Jesus. You remember when, right before Judas began to betray them and they were sitting there at what we call the Last Supper, he went and put his head on his breast and he said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? He said, the one that dippeth with me in the dish. And he, and then Judas began to do it. How did he know? Because he was close with Jesus. The scripture says that 
uh, 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 no good thing without, will I withhold from them which, which love me. The Holy Spirit, which resides in you and resides in me, will lead us and guide us and show us things to come. How's your Christianity working for you? Is it just going to church? Is it just paying tithes? And I'll get to that later. Is it just uh, 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 you saying prayers and singing? But how is your relationship vital and vibrant? What's God been saying to you lately? What's he been teaching you lately? What did he speak to you recently that saved you a whole lot of trouble and turmoil? How is what you believe working for you? Let the church say amen. In Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. And I'm reading this out of the New King James translation. I'm actually almost done. The scripture says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Listen to what the Message Bible says. Watch what God does and then do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Ain't that something? Watch what God does and then do it like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. What do you see the Lord doing in scripture? What actions do you take? Do, do, do you see him take? That's what you need to be doing. What do you see him doing in scripture? What do you see him doing in your heart? If he was physically here, what do you imagine that he would be doing in your community? In your life, around the people that you're connected with, that's what you need to be doing. What stirs your heart? What is standing out in you that God, that you can see God doing? That's what you need to do. I, I'm going to share an example with you. <clears throat> um, I had a situation. Um, there's a uh, another organization that I've um, partnered with and so forth. And um, they asked me to come in a meeting. And we're getting to a conference room and, you know, <clears throat> we just had another meeting and so forth. And all of a sudden, this man comes in and they said that um, he used to be, I guess, one of the clients that they had served. But they found out that he was, doctor told him he was dying with cancer. So here we are and we're in the meeting. And as far as I know... I, I guess I was there for moral support or whatever, but I didn't really know the person. So the other people in the meeting, they're sitting there talking with him, and the man, you, I could hardly understand what he was saying because he looked so dark, and he was just slumped over, and he was talking uh, like this, and all of a sudden, he just began to talk about his hate for a particular parent that he had. And all of a sudden, while I'm listening to this man talk, I feel such a compassion rising up in me. I felt like a righteous anger at what was going on with him. And I literally saw myself. Now, we sit here in a, 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 <laughs> a business setting, conference room, and the man sitting across from me. And all of a sudden, I see myself. Literally, almost like hop over the table to lay hands on this person. And I'm sitting here like, Lord, I can't do that. And all of a sudden, as he kept on talking, the desire got greater and greater. And I just kept seeing myself doing this. And I'm like, Lord, this can't be you. <laughs> do you know where I am? And so I said to myself, and don't act like y'all have never done this. Well, I tell you what, if this is you. Give me an opportunity. Well, you knew what was going to happen next. An opportunity came. So <clears throat> somebody turns and says, uh, well, Robert, would you like to pray? I said, I'll be happy to pray. But before I do that, I said, sir, can I ask you a question? And I began to ask him a question about that parent. And for about three or four minutes, I preached the word of God concerning unforgiveness. Let me tell you something. Unforgiveness is not about setting the other person free or letting them scot free. Unforgiveness is more about you. When they, when a person has hurt you, usually they don't even know that they've done it. 
And even if they had, because of what you know, you should know enough not to be offended. But anyway, I'll get into all that later. So I preached about how to, how to, how to, uh, uh, forgive by faith in the person of the Son of God, as the scripture says. And as I began to share this with them, and some of you all remember the tissues for issues example. And as we did that example, all of a sudden, I felt like something was crumbling off the man. And all of a sudden, his eyes got big. And next thing you know, just like I had been seeing moments ago, I hopped across that table. <laughs> I hopped across that table and laid my hand on him. And we began to pray. And saints, I kid you not, and I tell you the truth before God. The one who was slumped over talking like this sat up. His eyes were bright and white, and he was speaking coherently. That man came back about a month or two later, and somebody came to my office and they said, Hey, Robert, do you have a second? Come on in here, Pastor Hillman. Do you remember this man? And honestly, I didn't because he looked so different. The man looked at me and shook my hand. He said, thank you for praying for me. He said, I really didn't want prayer. He said, honestly, I got offended when you said what you said to me. He said, because I didn't know you, but I knew everybody else in the room. I was only doing what I saw God, what I saw the father doing. And as I did that, the man ended up being set free. He said, and here's what he said, and it brought tears to my eyes. He said, I had such hate for this particular parent, for all these years, he said, I'm to the point now, he said, for the first time in 60 some years, I live free. I don't have the hate. I don't have the anger. I don't have the the venom in my heart that, that I would, that I would have every day. And it caused him to drink and overload his body with alcohol. But he got set free that day by the power of God, saints. And guess what? Somebody, uh, I was, I was asking about him the other day and they said, I just missed him. I said, well, how's his health doing? They said, well, he looked mighty good to me because the doctor said he was supposed to have been gone by now. Somebody say hallelujah. Now I'm not sharing this story because I'm real special. I'm sharing this story to encourage your faith to let you know, let me tell you something, you got the same Holy Ghost that I got. Somebody say amen. What hinders us from doing this? And I'm almost done. I'll tell you what hinders us from doing this. Two things, not realizing that we are the same class of being that uh, our creator is and our father is. But number two, it's fear. I got news for you. You're afraid to do certain things that you know the Lord is speaking to you? Do it anyway. Do it scared. Do it afraid. Just do it. <laughs> there have been many times. The, the man that I just, I just spoke of, you, you think I wasn't scared to do that? You think I wasn't afraid to look like a fool? You think I wasn't afraid to be embarrassed, and especially in front of all these people? I did it anyway, though. And that's how we have to do. Someone say amen. Last point. As they went, as you go, something will happen. In Luke chapter 17, uh, verse 14, there were 10 lepers who asked Jesus to have mercy upon them. Jesus in verse 14 says, go and show yourselves to the priests. And the scripture says, and as they went, they were cleansed. As they went, they were healed. It didn't happen immediately. But as they moved out in response to what the Lord had told them, what? They were looking for manifested at Jesus's empty tomb in Matthew chapter 28, verse six through nine. The, uh, the angel appeared to them and said, he is not here. They saw the stone that was rolled away. And the angel said, go and tell his disciples that he's going before them and he's going to meet them in Galilee. And the Bible says, as they went, <laughs> as they went, the Lord appeared unto them. It says in as, verse nine, and as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them. As they went in every case, the Lord met them in some kind of way. Jesus has given us a specific directive to his church and every member of the body of Christ. Go ye, Mark chapter 16, verse 15, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And verse 20, as you move forward, and they, not talking about the apostles, but the church. 
And they went forth everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. As you go and as you step out in faith and obey what the Lord has told you, as you get in motion, the Lord will meet you. I've never seen so many believers throughout the body of Christ as a whole who keep talking about how anointed they are, but they're not doing anything. Let me tell you something. Oil is just oil as long as it remains in a bottle. But once it gets poured out, once it becomes in motion, then it becomes the anointing. Study the scripture as far as what it says about anointing people. If you see it first established when they would anoint uh, 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 the priests for service, you see it when they would anoint prophets and kings and so forth and people for service. We have greased people up enough that we can fry them like chicken. But the whole point of anointing is to be in motion for service for something. If you are anointed, as you claim that you're, I'm anointed, I'm anointed, I'm anointed. Well, what are you doing? Let the church say amen. How much do you value the kingdom of God? You can look at two places. You can look at your time and you can look at your money. Are you focused more on other things rather than seeking God's face and learning from him? Or are you spending all your time in the shopping mall? These days, shopping online. How about this? Are you spending more time watching Netflix than you are in your scripture? I'm not. Well, Pastor Hemming, you saying I can't never watch television? Of course not. I'm going to watch a movie today. I'm going to watch a ball game today if it come on. And I'm going to enjoy myself. I sure am. But what I'm going to do is not going to supersede the amount of time. I, I understand you work. I understand you have children. I understand you have all these things. But my Bible says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Let, let, me, let me go back to something. <clears throat> We live in days, and it's been like that always, but especially now, your relationship with God has to be your first priority. Hearing God's voice can not only mean life and death, but hearing God's voice can have a huge impact upon the direction of your life. I heard a, um, a pastor tell a story uh this week that really touched me. <clears throat> this particular uh, man said he had a friend <clears throat> and he had his own construction business. And that friend, had his best friend was uh, having a baby. And so they called him like three in the morning and said, hey, the baby's here, blah, blah, blah. So he got up and he told his wife, he said, listen, the baby's here. The wife said, well, I'm going to go later on in the morning. He said, well, I'm going to go now. So he grabbed up some stuff and he was getting ready to go, took a shower and stuff. Then all of a sudden he came down, he sat down on the bed and his wife said, why are you just sitting here? He said, well, honey, I'm, I'm praying to see which car I should drive because all of a sudden he felt like he couldn't decide which one for whatever reason. And his wife was like, well, I know he's kind of odd like that. He prays about everything. So she didn't think about it. She turned over, and went back to sleep. His rationale was, well, if I drive my car, then if I go to the hospital, then I'm going to have to come back and I'm going to have to switch cars because all my stuff is in my company car. But if I take the company car, do I really want to go to work this early? So he felt impressed, literally, after sitting on the corner of his bed, he prays. He's like, Lord, which car should I drive? Some of you might say, this is too extreme. This is just, this is just being too religious. You're being hypersensitive, all that. Let me finish my story. So the man prays. He feels like he's supposed to take his company car. He takes his company car. While he's out on the expressway, another car rams into him at a hundred miles an hour. The cars go over to the side. <clears throat> you know, he shook up. But fortunately, he's up and he's thinking, man, I need to go and check on the person that just hit me. Holy Spirit said, do not get out of your car. He didn't know why. He was just wanting to be a good Samaritan and check on the person behind him. So he stays in his car 
and he just waits. Come to find out, police come. This man who rammed into him as a, at 100 miles an hour was wanted for murder, and he was just in the process of running from the law. It's good to listen to the Holy Spirit, but I'm not done. If that man had driven his personal car, the insurance claim that he would have received would have been $25,000. Because of the insurance he had on his business car, you know how much he received? He ended up having some, some scrapes on his body. He ended up having to go to therapy and kind of learning how to walk better and again and all like that. Insurance on the company car was $1 million. The prayer that that man prayed on the corner of his bed made a difference of, and I hate to put this in financial terms, but I do this for the sake of how important it was, $975,000. You don't tell me something else? You don't tell me the show that you're watching is more important than your, your relationship with God? You're going to tell me that, that, that you're going out shopping and bowling and, 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 and spending all your time doing all this stuff is more important than developing your relationship with God? Where does your money go? The tithe, the offering. I was sitting in the office of a pastor friend of mine uh, this week, and he shared a story. He's, he's no longer a pastor. He actually pastored many years ago, <clears throat> but he's uh, retired from pastoring. And he shared with me how <clears throat> there was this one particular sister in his church, and he, and she was really struggling in many areas. And he tried to get her to understand the importance of giving and honoring God. And he wasn't trying to manipulate her or anything like that. He just wanted to teach her the truth about Scripture to be blessed. Here's what she told him defiantly. Well, Pastor, why should I go and do that? Because when I look at you, you don't look like you're doing much better than me. And the Lord heard that. He told me that all of a sudden, in the course of just a few years, he said it's like all of a sudden, all these things that he wasn't even asking God for, he just began to increase and increase and increase and increase and increase. And so one day he called that woman into his office. He said, you remember when you challenged me on this particular scripture? She said, yeah. And he began to go over her life and how her life had, had decreased further and further and further and further and further. And she said, Pastor, I'm so sorry. And then she was actually able to come up out of the pit that she was in because she started following the principles of giving. I'm not here to argue because a man with experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. God's word is true. Amen. Your success is based upon obeying God. Where am I going with this? Let's just look at it in terms of a church. A church is not successful because they have 12,000 members and they have 12 acres and all these buildings. That's great. We believe God for that. Wonderful. Awesome. I'm not against that at all. We thank God for increase with us. But success is not measured by who, how much you have and this, this, that, and the other. Success in our churches, in our lives, is not measured by how many cars you have, how many houses you have, how, how much money you make. Success is measured by one thing, your obedience unto the Lord. There's a pastor I know of <clears throat> in the Chicagoland area, and they have been pleading with their con congregation for some time. Listen, we need to go in this direction. We need to do this. People wouldn't support. They wouldn't come to church. They half gave. They half um, uh, came to prayer meeting. It was it was all these obstacles time and time again. So pastor got discouraged and was ready to quit. As they went to the Lord, the Lord spoke to them and said, what did I put in your heart to do? 
So the pastor said, okay. And one day he was just driving, the, the, the pastor rather was just driving around <clears throat> in another area. Um, it was actually across the state line. And as they were driving around, because they lived over there, and as they were driving around, there was this particular building that really stood out to them. And all of a sudden, they stopped and they looked. They said, man, I could really do a whole lot here. This area is ripe for a new ministry and blah, blah, blah. Saints, when that pastor made the decision that they were not going to give up and they were just going to go ahead and obey God, as the Lord lives, I verified this is true, somebody came forward and wrote out a check for the whole building. Now, all of a sudden, not only did somebody write out a check for the for the whole building, but the check that they were given, the person who was selling them said, I don't want to give it to you for that much. I'm going to lower the price. So they took that money <laughs> and put it into repairs for the building. Now, all of a sudden, you got this person coming in, donating to do work. This person coming in, helping with this. This organization coming in. We want to help with this. This part with the city. Well, we want to assist with this. Now, all of a sudden... Everything's coming together. You want to know why? Because somebody made a decision that success was not determined by what they saw, but success was determined by simply obeying God. Will you obey what God is telling you today? Will you stop looking at what it looks like that's happening in your life and how you feel and what people been saying and all this? I'm going over my time, but this I'm ministering to somebody on this morning. Stop looking. At the winds and the waves like Peter, but keep your eyes fixed upon Jesus. Because when you do, you'll keep walking on the water. Amen. The late apostle R.D. Hinton said this. If you take care of God's business, God will take care of yours. There's been plenty of times that I complained or I attempted to solve different things on my own or, 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 or figure out situations to no avail. Only to remember, and I alluded to it earlier, Matthew 6, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. By taking the focus off of me and putting the priority back upon the kingdom, I have noticed many times that when I stop and I get out of myself and begin to put the priorities with God back right, things just begin to fall in place. Let the church say amen. Take care of God's business and he'll take care of yours. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this word and we receive it with our whole heart and we will not only receive it, but we will apply it to our lives because we want the word to be mixed with faith in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. I want to thank all of you for your tremendous support of our ministry. It is you who love the ministry from not just here and your members of the congregation here in the Chicagoland area, but we thank God for all of you that are in different states that have been sowing and contributing. We want you to continue to do this. Amen. We want you to continue to be a blessing unto the Lord. If you would like to be a blessing unto the Lord, we have uh, an electronic link where you can be able to give via PayPal, or if you'd like to be able to give another way, you can send us a message and we'll be glad to help you in any way that we can for you to continue to be a blessing unto the ministry. Again, I want to thank all of you in advance for how you have been steadily giving to keep the ministry strong because we are going to come out of this. Amen. Not quite sure still yet as far as when we are going to be meeting. Initially, we were thinking the uh, beginning of August, but as many of you all have noted, uh, the cases have gone back on the rise, especially some of the surrounding areas and collar and, uh, collar counties that we are in and some of the surrounding states. So we're going to continue to be safe. Amen. As I said before, we'll surely let you know. We're going to be having a, um, congregational meeting on zoom uh probably within the next two weeks i will be letting i'll be sending out information to let you all know because there are several things that i want to be able to share with you amen also real quickly i want to remind everyone of 
the prayer meeting that takes place on Tuesdays. That's right. On Tuesdays, we have a congregational prayer meeting. And if you have not been a part of that yet, we want you to make sure that <clears throat> you are participating with that on Zoom uh, every Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. Amen. This time, I just want to uh, pray for the saints and all of you that uh, have been viewing. Amen. We thank God for, again for each and every one of you. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for all of those under the sound of my voice and all those that are viewing this live stream right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray first and foremost for the peace of God. Lord, we thank you that you've said, my peace I leave with you, not as the world giveth, but my peace. Lord, some are facing enormous situations, but they are minute for you. And so, Lord, I thank you for the peace of God, which is able to pass all understanding and guard, keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Father, I thank you right now for revealing your presence. I thank you that the angels of the Lord stand by us and protect us. Lord, we thank you that the angel of the Lord encampeth around those that fear you. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, those that would be facing any financial lack, Father, I pray that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour them out a blessing that they do not have room enough to receive. Lord, you said you've met all of our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Father, I thank you for bringing it to pass now in the name of Jesus. I'm going to pray for people who are sick, but I just want to share something real quick with you. <clears throat> friend of mine, Apostle Paul Sherrill, when he lived in a particular part of the country, he was on rough times and his refrigerator was empty. And as he was sitting there and he was looking at his family, they cried out unto the Lord as a family. <clears throat> All of a sudden, they happened to look out the window and there was this big truck backing into where they lived. Nobody called for it. Nobody asked for it. When they came outside to see what was going on, this man pulled up in this truck and unloaded all these groceries to be a blessing for them. Nothing. <clears throat> nothing. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. I remember one time, Years ago, my family was on hard times. And my wife took 20 bucks and went to the store and got groceries for a week or two. How's that possible? The Lord. There is nothing impossible with him. I don't care what you're dealing with. I don't care how big the situation is. God is enough. And he's going to provide for you. He's going to take care of you. But you've got to trust him and you've got to obey him and believe him. Amen. For all of you that are ill and may have pain in your body or is dealing with a particular sickness or a disease. Father, in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Touch now from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. You that are watching. If there's a particular place that you have pain, I want you to place your hand as a point of contact in faith. Lord, in Jesus' name, I curse that condition. I curse that pain. Ah, let them go now. I speak perfect wholeness and soundness in the name of Jesus. If you had problems with your back, just start moving your back and do the things that you could not do. Test it out. If you had problems seeing, just begin to put a hand over there and start seeing in the name of Jesus. Sister Keisha, I ain't forgot about you. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you. From the crown of her head down to the sole of her feet, 
I thank you for perfect wholeness and soundness. And oh God, <laughs> strengthen her that she might be able to receive meat <laughs> and be strengthened. She know what I'm talking about. And God's people said, amen. Hallelujah. We love you. God bless you. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in on today. If you've enjoyed today's live stream, send us a message. We want to hear from you. Just telling us we're doing a good job or telling us how the Lord has blessed you and encouraged you. Please, we need encouragement too. Amen. God bless you all. Love your saints. Bye-bye.